So hello, hello everybody. My name is Pierre Krieger, also known as Tomaka on GitHub. And this talk is named the top nine most common mistakes to avoid when you start writing a wrapper around a C library. And it doesn't work, doesn't matter. But before getting started, let's define what a wrapper is. So the idea is that a wrapper is simply a regular Rust library that, that acts as a bridge between Rust and C, which are two different worlds. Rust is safe and C is unsafe. Rust and, Rust and C have different kind of APIs. And a wrapper is here to make the bridge between the two. But writing a wrapper is not an easy task and it can, and can be very difficult because of the differences between the two languages. So here are, and these differences can introduce mistakes in your code. So here are the biggest mistakes, or not the biggest, but most common mistakes I see in libraries in the ecosystem. Mistake number nine not catching Rust panics within callbacks called by the C library. So when your C library uses a callback-based design, so you register a callback and this callback calls a Rust function, one thing that can be easy to, to forget is that the C language is not capable of handling Rust panics. So this, the code here is dangerous because if user provided function that may panic actually panics, then bad things are going to happen. The stack is going to unwind into C code and everything's going to fall apart and probably crash. Instead, you always have to use the catch and win function, which was introduced this morning, by the way. <laughs> yes. Good coincidence. Uh, so always wrap your REST code around our own catch and wind and handle the result. I was asked earlier today how you are supposed to handle errors in these situations, and it really depends on the C library. Sometimes you just need to abort, you have no real choice. Sometimes you can use a poisoning system, but it really depends on C library, it's a case by case situation. Okay, mistake number eight, not testing your wrapper on a large scale. So that's obviously more easily said than done. But yeah, <laughs> but I really advise you to write at the same time at the same time your wrapper and a large scale project that actually uses your wrapper. And that's very useful because it's going to let you find flows in your API, things you didn't necessarily you didn't necessarily think about. And it talks, it also acts as a giant test suit. Whenever you make a modification in your wrapper that's not really trivial, you can just execute your big, your large scale project and see if it still works. And of course, that's not fail proof, but if it doesn't work, at least you know you have a problem. So it's kind of a giant test suit. Mistake number seven, assuming that structs and enums have a certain layout. So for example, in the code at the top, you have a strict, a strict name foo with two fields named A and B, a U8 and a, and a U32. And the mistake here would be to assume that B comes after 8 in memory, while in reality, it's not necessarily the case. The compiler is free to optimize the, the layout of the structs as it wishes. So I think, I'm not sure, but I think that right now, it's not the case. Right now, the compiler isn't going to optimize anything, but it could be the case in the future anyway. If that's not the case yet, I'm not sure, actually. So if you want to be, to be bulletproof here, you should not assume that B comes after 80 memory. If you really need, or if you need to ensure that B actually comes after 8, you have to use the repr C annotation, and that forces the layout. Similarly, something that you can sometimes find in Rust libraries, that's not necessarily related to C libraries, but that's also a problem in general, is when people transmute between arrays and tuples. That's, uh, that's actually very dangerous because for the same reason as I just explained. The compiler does not necessarily 
put the two elements of a tuple right next to each other, even though right now it's the case, for that I'm sure. Right now it's the case, but it's not totally sure that it's going to be always the case. So don't do that. Mistake number six. Trying to write a high-level abstraction first. So in this example code, you have a create objects function. I put it in an external block to, to show that it represents the, the API of C library. So the C library provides a function named create objects, which take an array as parameter in the form of a pointer and a number of elements. And I inverted the two parameter. Usually it's a pointer first, but whatever. And the create object function, create objects function creates a number of objects equal to num objects. But since you're trying to provide a nice API over this in Rust, what you do is create a, t a type name object, a struct, which wraps around the concept of an object. And you provide a function name new, which calls create objects and only creates one object because that's what people will do most of the time and that's what's convenient. But if you do that, what is going to happen sooner or, la sooner or later is that someone is going to open an issue in your, rep in your repository saying that they call the new function thousands of times and since the C library could create a thousand objects at once, they are going to wonder if how they could do so with your wrapper. And you have two solutions to handle this issue. Either you say, I'm too lazy to fix this, or you take a lot of time to rewrite your library. Of course, here is a it's a simple situation, so it's not going to take a lot of time to fix this. But in a real large-scale wrapper, it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, so, by the way, that's a bit uh, caricatural. In, in reality, you shouldn't hesitate about opening issues. Do, do not think that the complaining user here is... Uh, do not think that it's annoying to open issue. It's better to have too many issues than too few. What I advise you to do is first write uh, an API that is as close to the C library as possible. But, by, uh, but still remain safe while doing so. Your, uh, your API should still be safe, but it should be as close to the C API as possible. So in the example here, here is, all, here, is all, here is how you fix this. You first write a create object. Is there a pointer here? Or whatever. You first write a create objects wrapper, a wrapper on create objects, but directly calls the C function create objects, and that can return any number of objects as needed. And then on top of create objects, you add another function named foo, which creates one, which creates one object. So you have the best of both worlds. People who need to create thousands of objects at, one, at once can simply call create objects, and most people who are just looking for a convenient API we just call new. But what I advise you is to first write create objects. First write a wrapper around create objects and then only you call new. And then later, if needed, you can always optimize new to be more efficient if that's needed. Mistake number five ignoring the problem of leak safety. And we're going to play a little game, try to spot the problem. So here is, uh, from here on, it's going to get a bit more trickier. So we have a C API represented by the extern block. The C API provides uh, an object named foo, which I didn't show here for, for the sake of being brief. And there are three functions one function to lock a foo, one function to unlock it once it's locked, and one function named do something, which must not be used while foo is locked. That's what the C library says. Do not call do something while the foo is locked because I don't handle that. And your Rust wrapper that you're, that you're writing 
provides a wrapper around the concept of a foo, which I named here foo wrapper. It provides two, function, two functions, do something and lock, which simply call the C functions directly. They just call the C functions directly, except that the lock function returns a guard object. If you're familiar with the concept of RAII in C++, that's exactly this, this principle. The lock method returns an object named locked, named lock, which represents the fact that the foo is currently locked. And the destructor of foo calls unlock foo. So try to find what is wrong here. I forgot the lock. Uh, that's not a problem, that's just me, uh, because it wouldn't fit in a slide. <laughs> the lock object has, a, has an exclusive borrow of full wrapper. Actually, I'm going to explain, because the explanation is in the next slide. So this is how you're supposed to use this API. You call foo.lock, and you get back a lock object. So the lock object at the bottom here. And then while the lock object is alive, you cannot call do something, because the lock object has an exclusive borrow of the foo, and do something also needs an exclusive borrow of foo, and you can't have two exclusive borrows, so you get a compilation error. So that's, that's the intent of this API. That's what this API is trying to do. And it's quite nice, you think. You, you ensure at compile time that you cannot call do something while the foo is locked. That's quite nice. But actually, this is unsafe because you can actually bypass the borrow. You can simply call, as shown in the, in the second block of code, you can simply call mem forget on the lock, and the foo is actually going to stay locked while your lock variable disappears. And then the user will be able to call do something even though the foo is still locked and you're, vi you're violating the rules of the C API wrapping around and that's really just bad. So the rule here is to never assume that the structures are going to be called. That was also mentioned this morning. It's called the leak apocalypse or something like that. It's a famous event at the time of 1.0, the leak apocalypse. And how you fix this problem in your wrapper is by using a technique named pre-pooping your pants. So that, that's, that's not, I didn't name that myself. So someone came up with a name. Uh, and I mentioned this name here, so you can Google it, but I recommend Googling Rust, pre-pooping your pants, and not just pre-pooping your pants. That's my suggestion. So the idea here to fix this is that you need a second field in your foo wrapper that contains whether or not the foo is currently locked. So when you call do some, when your user calls do something or lock, you first have to check at runtime whether the variable contains, you need to ensure that the is locked variable field is false. Otherwise, you're violating the C API. And in the drop, in the destructor of lock, your write false is in, your write false is in is locked. And that's, that, add a, that adds a small runtime overhead, but unfortunately, there's no real choice here. Mistake number four, forgetting about hidden global variables. I'm going to take the example of the OpenAL open sound library here because it's really representative. So the way you use the OpenAL library is you first create what is called a context with a function that I didn't show here, which is called ASC create context or whatever. It's not the point here. You first create a context then you set the context as current by calling ALC make context current. And only one context can be current at any given time. And once you've made a context current, 
all the functions of the OpenEA library that you call apply to the current context, but to the context that you set as current. And if, if you think about it, this is, in fact, a global variable hidden inside the OpenEA library. When you call AIC make context current, what you're essentially doing is you just set the value of this global variable. And this design is really not thread safe at all because if you have two threads that are trying to use OpenEA at the same time, one, thread one calls AAC make context current and does some OpenAI stuff. Thread two calls AAC make context current while thread one is running and it will modify the behavior of thread one and that's bad and that's really thread unsafe. So you may think, but what if I use a mutex? And that's usually the solution people can come up with. So that's the code here is what you would put in your wrapper. You create a mutex named current context mutex, a static mutex. And whenever you want to do something with OpenEL, you first lock the mutex, and then only you call ESC make context current. So if two threads try to call do something at the same time, they are not going to conflict because the second thread is going to wait until do something is finished in the first thread before starting. Uh, do you think that this is safe if I use a mutex? And that's not a good question because if it was, I wouldn't talk about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Why? Because if you create a project named project, which uses two dependencies, OpenAL, your OpenAL wrapper and, and no third party dependency named over sound library, and this third party library uses OpenAL, the OpenAL wrapper as well, but a different version, what Cargo is going to do in this situation here, I showed you the small dependency graph, what Cargo is going to do here is that it, it's going to put two different versions of open year, of an open year wrapper at the same time, but with only one open year. In your final executable, you're going to have only one open year, but you're going to have two open year wrappers. So you're going to have two different mutexes for only one open year, for only one global variable hidden inside open year. So if you try to use OpenEA wrapper and over sound library at the same time in two different threads, but we each lock their own version of a mutex and they will conflict with each other. So you're, you can't do that. And the problem here, as my conclusion, is that there's just no solution. OpenEA can unfortunately not be wrapped around safely. Or if you have an idea, let me know because I really don't. You have an idea? <laughs> okay, well, we can talk later if you have an idea. Um, other examples of similar impossible APIs are xlib because of a function named xset or handler. And I actually have a, a wrapper on xlib myself and I know it's unsafe, but I really have no choice. Get env, and because you're not going to, to say screw xlib just because of this, unfortunately, it has too much market share still. <laughs> yeah. Get env and set env are also unsafe, uh, cannot be wrapped around safely, but fortunately, since the stllib wraps around it and you can only have one version of the stllib in any given executable, then it's safe, actually. Over example of APIs that are problematic, but also have a global a kind of global variable-ish thing. Our uh, OpenGL, several APIs from the Windows operating system. Uh, they both have a cons they both let you set properties for the current thread. So you have to spawn a background thread when you want to do stuff. That's also a runtime overhead, but you have no choice. And other libraries that have a global initialization function, you have to take care that the initialization and deinitialization functions are reference counted. If you call deinitialize while something else is still using the library, then it's bad. 
Mistake number three, reading primitives from memory without checking. So it concerns uh, three different things, floating points, bulls, and cars. So Rust say the specifications of Rust say that booleans must only count, must the, the, represent, the memory representation of booleans must always be either one or zero. Although this is technically unspe unspecified, but whatever. Re a memory representation of cars must always be a valid unicorn scalar value. And the memory representation of floating points must never be a signaling none. So if you have memory and you don't know what it contains, it's dangerous to read a bool, a car, or a floating point from it. You, you, can ju you cannot just blindly read memory because this is very dangerous. And i give some examples here. In the first example, if the if uninitialized, if an uninitialized function returns something else than zero or one, then you have an infined behavior. And the second example is an undefined behavior as well. And of course, structs that are made of bulls, cars, and floating points are also concerned. So how you check this? For floating points, you use the from bits functions. You first, you first read an integer and then you call from bits on that integer. Instead of reading a bool, you also first read an integer and then check whether the integer is different from zero. And for cars, there's a function named car from u32. So you first read a u32 and then you call these functions. This function and these, these four, well, these three functions and comparing whether integer is different from zero are, the, are what you should do to ensure that you're actually doing something correct and not undefined behavior. Mistake number two, assuming that thread implementations are bug free. And this one is really tricky. So we're going to spot, we're going to play try to spot the problem again. So the C API that you're trying to wrap around here, again in an external block, it's very simple here. You have a function, a C function named foo, which takes as parameter an array. The array is passed as a pointer and, and the number of elements. If you have ever done any C in your life, you're probably familiar with that. And in Rust, we are trying to wrap around this API with a foo wrapper API. So since you're trying to write a convenient API, you make your through wrapper function generic over any type that implements deref to an array of u8. So what that means is that the array arc parameter can be anything that represents an array. That's you, you write your wrapper, you're trying to be convenient. And then you simply call the c function, the foo function, you call as PTR and len on your array, and you call the, the foo functions, the foo function with these parameters. And if you have an idea of a problem here. Sorry? I don't add. As pointer may panic. Oh. No, uh, it's not a problem here. The, uh, you don't have any callback, any callback. Yes, that's the problem. So the problem here is that since full wrapper can accept anything, the user, the user of your library can simply write malicious pointer. So the user of your library writes malicious pointer. It contains two fields, two vex. And the user implements deref on malicious pointer. And half of the time, the deref function is going to return the first vec, and half of the time, the second vec. So you may think, uh, why would someone do this? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to, to come to this. And what's happening if you create a malicious pointer and you call full wrapper with it? With it is that what could end up happening, uh, uh, let me explain first. 
When you call array arg dot as PTR, what happens in reality is that you call array arg dot deref dot as PTR. And when you call array arg dot len, what happens in reality is you call array arg dot deref dot len. So what could end up happening is that you get a function, a pointer to a first vec and the length of a second vec, and then bad things are going to happen. Ouch. So back to the question, why would someone do that? Ob obviously, nobody is going to write a malicious pointer. But in any real life project, what could end up happening is a bug in a threat implementation. So that's, obvious, that's obviously a very serious bug. But it could really be a bug. And oh, I, OK, I, I thought my other slide was next. Uh, it could be a real bug in the DRF implementation and not intended. So how do we solve that? The first solution is to call DRF at the start of a function. So you turn your array arc parameter into an actual slice of U8. At the fir for the first, the first line does that, and the second line calls the full function. But sometimes this solution can be inconvenient. So the second solution is to use a custom unsafe thread. So instead of requiring DRF, you require a thread named unsafe DRF. And basically, the burden of implementing DRF correctly is on the user of, li of your library. So basically, what was in um, in the lines two and three, you have these unsafe keywords, and that means that the person who implements the safe DREF threat guarantees that safe DREF is actually implemented correctly. So, so basically, you, as, a, as a writer of your wrapper, you only write through wrapper, and the user of your wrapper has to write uh, impl safe DREF for whatever they want. And here are, all, uh, here are all the examples of threats which can be dangerous, as ref, borrow, partial ek, ek, partial old, old hash, iterator, if you use any of these. For example, iterator, if the uh, number of elements return, if the number of elements returned by size, size hint doesn't match the actual number of elements in the iterator, then it could happen, it could actually be a bug. Someone implements iterator on their custom type and they have a mismatch between what size hint returns and what next returns. So, and you ha when you write your wrapper, you have to be aware of that. You, for example, you shouldn't allocate a block of uninitialized memory of a certain number of elements and then only r and then don't write any element because the iterator is actually empty. So that's just an example. I didn't really write it as code. I just quickly went over it. If you use any of the threads, you have to be aware of this kind of problems. And mistake number one. So this is uh, an API-related mistake. Using lifetimes for long-lived objects. So a very common situation in C libraries is that the C, libraries, the C library provides, with, provides you with two types of objects named A and B, and says that you must ensure that A outlives B. And the common solution as a writer of a wrapper is to use a lifetime. That's what, that's what comes to mind when you want to write to wrap around this API. So you, the, li the C library says that A must outlive B, so your, your wrapper on B holds a borrow to A. Well, by the way, we ignore the problem of leak safety because it's not the topic here. However, using a lifetime actually is more restrictive than just the concept of outlives. The C API says, says that B must outlive A, uh, sorry, A must outlive B, but a borrow is more restrictive than that. And the problem with being more restrictive than the restriction in question is that the B, or is it the A, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the A must not move in memory as long as it's being borrowed. The consequences of that is that 
someone trying to use a wrapper cannot put an A and a B both in the same struct, and that's a problem. Why, why they can't do that? Because what do you use as a lifetime? The lifetime here should be self. Quote self, but that doesn't exist. Maybe it will exist in a long future, but for now it doesn't exist. So um, what I advise you to do is simply use only lifetimes for temporary objects, the kind of objects that you only keep on the stack. So locks or accessors. What I mean by keep on the stack is that at the beginning of a function, you create an object, and then the object is dropped at the end of a function. For this kind of types, you can use lifetimes, but when you have objects that live for a long time, do not use lifetimes. Instead, I suggest you use arcs and RCs. And that's also a small runtime overhead, but again, it's, I think in my, that's my personal opinion, but it's better than these restrictions because users are going to be really confused about how you to use your API. And as a, conclu as a conclusion, if, you, if you're writing a wrapper on the, around the C library, I strongly recommend that you read the Restonomicon, which I put the URL here. And uh, if you feel overwhelmed by the safety-related problems, you have to, you have to be positive. And keep in mind that safe trust actually protects you against all these problems. Well, if you, write, if you were writing C, you would have to deal with this. And uh, second thing I advise you is to take inspiration from the API guidelines, the official API guidelines, which I also provided a link here. They are, in my opinion, they are not perfect, but they are also a very good starting point. And that's it. Thank you so much. We have time for one question. You won. <laughs> um, you were asking about uh, if anyone had ideas for the multiple version of the libraries, and there's that cargo.toml key links equals a string that I never really understood what it was for, but does that solve the problem? Or does it still conflict when you have multiple versions? Um, uh, the problem with, I'm going to back to the, to the slide, where is it? The problem is that when you, here is the dependency graph of your project. In the cargo.toml of your project, you only have OpenEL wrapper and, and other sound library. You don't really know which version of OpenEL wrapper is used by other sound library. I mean, you can know it, but it's, not, it's none of your concern. The person who writes over sound library could decide to bump the version of OpenEL wrapper without notifying you. So you don't, as, the, if you're, when you're, as a writer of a project, you don't control the version of OpenEL wrapper. You don't control the version 0 0.1 here. So you can't ensure that they are the same version. Do you have a short comment? Or is it? No mango? Um, yeah, I see what you mean. Um, you, can, you can fix that with no. Basically, uh, if, you write, if you're the writer of the OpenEL wrapper library, you can ensure that people can have two different versions of OpenEL library, of OpenEL wrapper in their project. As the wrapper, as the writer, sorry, I'm, I'm going, I'm getting messed up. As the writer of Open EL wrapper, you can ensure that this doesn't happen. But if someone else writes another Open EL wrapper, then you have the same problem. Maybe you can solve this in the hallway, because we are out of time. I'm sorry, but thank you so much for your talk, Pierre. Thank you.